Welcome to Success at Scale, the podcast that covers business stories from experienced entrepreneurs, business leaders, and startup founders on how to translate business ideas into business results. I'm your host, Greg Stein, and today we're going to talk with Chris, who's a co-founder and CEO at Fireflies AI. And if you haven't checked out Fireflies AI, this is badass technology that you need to know about. So we're going to have some fun today. Anyways, Chris, thanks so much for joining us. Tell us about you. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, where do I start? I guess I can start with my journey uh, and what led to Fireflies. Uh, for folks that are, are listening in, Fireflies is an AI meeting assistant. It joins your meetings across Zoom, WebEx, Skype, all the major video conferencing platforms, and it takes notes. Afterwards, it transcribes the meetings. You can search, you can get insights, uh, you can collaborate. It's essentially there so that you don't have to do the busy work. So that's Fireflies in a nutshell. And I guess what inspired me to start was before Fireflies, I was a product manager at Microsoft. Uh, I got to work across the various collaboration suites across different teams. So whether that was Skype or Office and learn a lot about how you know corporate works. And that was my first gig out of college. Uh, and as a PM, you do end up taking lots of meetings. Sometimes you're a glorified secretary. And through that journey, I realized we need to have more efficient ways to take meetings. And uh, that inspired the journey. And then we said one of the biggest opportunities is looking at voice and all that information that's buried inside conversations. And then that one thing led to another, flew out to Boston uh, where I worked with a friend and we started up Fireflies and that is what it is today. How long have you been working on Fireflies? So I left Microsoft around uh, 2016 and from that time so that we've had many pivots and many adjustments. So what I've glanced over is the journey, the struggle. So we probably pivoted five or six times. So we consulted for a long time, did like healthcare projects, did uh, built like Slack bots, did chat bots. Like back then, like the chat bot ecosystem was like the craze. Slack just opened up uh, its app store. So we did lots of different things. We bootstrapped for several years. Uh, and it wasn't until 2019 that the version of Fireflies that we're working on got started. And so we raised our seed round in 2019 from Canaan Partners uh, at the end of 2019. And then 2020, January was when we rolled out the current, current version of Fireflies that you see on meetings today, the, the bot or the meeting assistant. And, you know, one, two months later, the pandemic accelerated, uh, digital adoption went through the roof as people were working remotely. Um, and what we were working on became front and center. And since then, it's been a whirlwind journey, a lot of roller coaster rides, uh, ups and downs. Uh, you have to really, you know, learn on the spot. So I would say like really the start of our journey was 2020, but there was a lot of lessons learned uh, before that. Oh, uh, pretty crazy. A uh, couple of things there, right? So going from Microsoft, big company, established company to startup, doing it during this time of, you know, in, in the end of your story, this pandemic rolled into town right when you were starting, right? So it might be cool to talk about both of those as a way of transition and timing and, you know, the pros and cons of, of uh, you know, starting a business in a pandemic. Yeah. The nice thing about uh, Microsoft was that you have structure and you have an opportunity to learn. Great place if you're early out of school and just want to understand how to work in the workplace, right? Not just the technology, the skills the, that you have as an engineer, but just how do you work in the workplace? What do enterprises do, right? How do they prioritize things? So that was like a fast learning experience for me to understand uh, all the nooks and crannies of like how large organizations work, even like working with really large customers, right? Like many customers that are in the fortune 500, fortune 1000. So you have a brand that you can lean on and Microsoft's a fantastic brand. Uh, once you go do a startup, right? There is no real structure. Like there is no right or wrong answer. You are trying to figure things out on your own. You set your own week, you set your own priorities. And uh, ultimately at the end of the day, it's the hours, right? That's what you're paying yourself in. Like, what are you utilizing those hours for? And a lot of folks will sort of moonlight or do some stuff on the side and then go full on. 
in my case, I went head first in, like I didn't do anything. So it was before that, it was just Microsoft. And then I jumped straight into a startup. Uh, when I was in college, I had done a lot of hackathons and worked on different ideas and started scaling up small teams around that. So I actually met my co-founder in college when we were working on a hackathon, but I've never actually taken something full scale before. So, you know, one thing I would advise is like, playing the game of entrepreneurship feels fun because there's this excitement and it feels glamorous. Um, but it wasn't the case maybe like a decade ago or two decades ago. But when you think about it, there are so many ups and downs to entrepreneurship and all the folks that are listening that are going through it right now. Um, it's one thing to read about it in a tech crunch article, one thing to read about it in a book uh, or an MBA class. And it's another thing uh, to roll your sleeves up, get in the trenches and actually do it. Uh, and so the way I always think about entrepreneurship is like walking through a desert without a map and you are just wandering and many people will quit before they get to the end. Uh, but you know, that that's, that's what it was and mentors help guidance helps. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to figure out what it is you're doing, who, what are you solving? Um, and the single compass that you have is what do your customers care about? Like, who are your customers? What do they care about? What do you, what should you be building and why should they even give you two minutes of their time? Right. Cause you get a lot of no's during that process, like Ooh, even more than the fundraising process, that's the most critical thing, uh, from an entrepreneurship point of view, switching to the pandemic, uh, right. Like we finally figured out what we wanted to build, uh, who we wanted to deliver this for. And, uh, we enter this period of uncertainty. Like we don't know what's going to happen. Like is fundraising going to dry up? Are our company is going to do layoffs? Uh, what is going on, right? So it's one thing from going through that journey, 2019, 2020, building the product, uh, going to beta. And then now as you go live, um, you don't know what's going to happen. And what's funny is with Fireflies, we actually built with the intention of it being in, used in conference rooms, right? Like, so if you're in a conference room and you have Polycom set up and all that, so we didn't imagine a 100% remote world uh, when we started Firefly. So as Zoom and other video conferencing platforms extended themselves, Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, it became more of a natural extension and helped us get more penetration inside organizations. Um, and so that was more of a blessing for us. And uh, we were fortunate to be at the right place at the right time, uh, for lack of better words. Uh, then the problem shifts, like all of a sudden you go from building something and hoping someone wants it to, holy crap, there's a lot of demand for it. We need to now deliver. Uh, we, we need to, you know, maintain expectations. There's this level of trust people are having, right. Uh, where I can show up late to a meeting, but Fireflies has to show up all the time, every time, 24 seven. And it is an intense operations, uh, because by the time your meetings are done nine to five in the U S time zone then like in other countries, it starts picking up, right? India, like overseas, the UK. So we have to really build a 24 seven culture. Um, so it was a very dramatic shift for us. These are good problems to have, like, uh, but now there's this pressure of, can I keep up? Can I deliver on my, on this promise? Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it shifted like 180 degrees completely. And, uh, we had to level up. So how do you how do you change that mindset, right? Like you're going along going, please, please give me a customer. And now all of a sudden, you know, it's raining customers and you got to be 24 seven. How do you change your mindset? How did you change the culture to be able to step up to this challenge? Right. In the early days, nothing is perfect. Uh, there will be constant bugs, small issues. Uh, you know, when I look at something today, I look at all the flaws, right? Even today, like how far we've come. The things that I immediately notice is like, oh, why is this button slightly to the left? What is this color like? Okay, why is there like, you know, why do I have to click this twice instead of once? So you get trained to only look at flaws. And uh, sometimes you miss the bigger picture of, wow, we've come a long way. We worked really hard uh, and we built something, you know, massive throughout this whole journey. So the thing that kept us going all the time was just being customer obsessed like I still read every single support ticket, like till recently. Um, and I would look at every customer feedback, every positive thing, as well as negative things. And I'm someone that takes those things personally and want to get better. So I love criticism as much as I like, like positive stuff. Sometimes I like try to avoid the positive stuff because that, uh, can make you softer. So I, it was all about like getting the team to be pragmatic 
Um, we try to be humble. We try to be lean, uh, like lean and self-sufficient as much as possible. Uh, and you know, you slowly start chipping away, uh, you know, one brick at a time, you start putting in the foundation and try to get better and better and better. But there are many nights, right? Where at 2 AM, 3 AM, you ask yourself, what are we doing? Like, uh, can we actually see like the next month? Like, can we deal with this sort of chaos for another month, another two months, another three months, right? That's like servers going up and down, like, uh, you know, trying to scale the team and the growth problems you have around that. Um, it's not one problem, right? It's not like taking one class in college. Uh, it's like having to do 10 finals or 10 midterms at once. So yeah, that, that was definitely a tricky phase and we still go through it. Like what I always like to say is it's definitely hard in the early days before you have product market fit, but once you have product market fit, it's not necessarily smooth sailing. Uh, you know, having, hiring a great team, having resources, having funding definitely helps, um, where you can start delegating. It's just the problems don't go away. The nature of the problems change. So that's the only difference. It's really funny to hear you say that because we I've been doing quite a few of these podcasts recently, and uh, I've heard this theme kind of come up multiple times. But one thing that I, I typically hear is, you know, look, at the end of the day, because here we are talking about culture, right? It, it's down to the people, right? So A, how do you find the right people? And B, how do you make sure that you're kind of mentoring them and, and keeping them, you know, aligned with your way of thinking? The single most... Uh, skill or trait that I look for now uh, more than experience is accountability uh, and uh, this attention to detail. Uh, I know that I am extremely detail oriented and I want to be a perfectionist, uh, but there's only so much you can do yourself. And if you have other people that come with that DNA from the get-go, you don't have to tell someone twice. Like the moment you have to start telling someone to pay attention to something or look at something twice or three times, um, you know, it loses its uh, efficacy and it loses its, uh, you know, uh, think about it like a friend that you have to tell like, hey, make sure you do this, make sure you do this, make sure you do this. And like, make sure you pick me up at this time. And, you know, no matter how many times you tell them, you know, they're going to mess up. That's much harder. But the best teammates to have and, you know, rule that applies to life in general, friends, family, all of that. There's people you can trust, people that have your back, uh, people who deliver on their promises and people who have this attitude of, I may not know it, but I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to try to do the best I can and get better at it. Right. So uh, taking challenges as they come, not backing away from it. Um, I said one, but th there is this type, this character type, this DNA of this person, this hustler that, that you want. And when many of your teammates are like that, it lifts the entire team up as a whole and uh, gets people going. So we made many mistakes in hiring. But the culture part uh, is something to not underestimate because that sets the foundation. That is the pillars on top of what you build. Sometimes we've hired for experience or, oh, they worked in a similar domain. They've done these things. They got five years of experience, six years of experience. But then you realize there's other people who are more hungry, who are more determined, who are consistently trying to give their best that will outpace someone that's coming in with experience. Experience is definitely important, right? If you need to do high totally. scalability infrastructure or scale a product to millions of users, yeah, it, it's definitely going to be valuable to have someone that has that DevOps and SRE, like site reliability engineering, all of those things is absolutely valuable. But I think sometimes we overvalue the experience versus someone's tenacity. Um, so I think the one answer to culture is really accountability and tenacity. Amazing. So here's the real question. What's next for Fireflies? Like, you know, you, you're on to something that's that's really big. And I, I think you're just at the beginning of it. This is just my personal view. I've used your technology and, and I really love it. And it's I'm finding that each meeting I'm going to, it's now popping up at the beginning of every meeting like it did here on the, even on this call. So here's the here's the question. Like, where where do you go next for us? Fireflies today was to help make your life easier by taking notes, capturing everything, transcribing everything, making it easily searchable. We wanted to start with the individual and make them really successful at remembering their conversations and making sure we got the busy work done for them. So that was a starting point. The next steps of Fireflies, which we're doing now, is how do we start automating some work for you? Right. For example, if you're a salesperson, we'll go into your CRM, right? Fireflies after the call knows who you spoke with. It'll automatically generate notes, 
put a link to the transcript and auto complete your Salesforce or auto complete your HubSpot CRM. Uh, we integrate with dozens of different CRMs. Um, you know, I want to be able to get work done from meetings. So that's like what we're doing today. And so, you know, we rolled out like an Asana and Trello integrations, where if I say a certain voice command on a meeting, it'll go create like a uh, card inside Asana or Trello or task, right? So just with the sound of my voice, I'm getting work done. Uh, so that's like was the second phase. And then now we're focused on delivering insights, right? So like, what can we do on top of the transcription and the meetings? And how can we deliver insights to you? Were you talking too much on a meeting? Were you using too many filler words? Uh, were your competitors being brought up too much time? How many times were you guys discussing pricing on a negotiation call? Uh, you know, for your candidate that you were talking to, how many times did they bring up JavaScript as like a skill? Uh, what were the questions that your customers were asking? What were some of the uh, most frequent uh, types of sentiment that's coming up on different types of calls? So there's so much we can do on top of voice in terms of delivering insights. And so Fireflies is aiming towards becoming a full-fledged platform from something that helps you take notes and remember your meetings and be present to completing work inside the systems you already you know, use, like Slack, Salesforce, uh, you know, Asana, all of these other tools, to now delivering insights for a team as a whole. So we're great as a single-player product, like single-player mode, but now Fireflies is really this end-to-end -end platform for teams where they can draw insights, they can collaborate, and they can do everything. What is, uh, so let's say you achieve all of this, what does success look like? For us, it's great to see fireflies in different types of meetings and uh, being able to have folks recognize the brand, recognize what it does. Um, you know, I was talking to one of our teammates and they looked through the data and they said fireflies has attended meetings across 70% of the Fortune 500. Right. And we've spent little to almost no money in the last two years on ads uh, like social media ads or any of that. It's all been word of mouth, organic. Uh, there's been a viral component to it. And for us, success is when someone can visit the Fireflies website or see it in a meeting, recognize it, uh, feel like it can give them value, go to the website and sign up without having to talk to anyone if they don't want to um, and uh, get the most out of Fireflies. For me, success is can we enable you, right, through our self-service motion, uh, through the way you use Fireflies? And then can we provide value not just to you, but your teammates, right? Not just maybe your sales team, but your recruiting team, your product team, your marketing team. Uh, we really believe Fireflies is a product that a lot of folks, the first time you start using it to the time it starts spreading inside your organization, every new employee that you know, joins your company will want to look into the Fireflies repository, right? Because it's so much unique knowledge around all your voice conversations. So for us, success is when your entire team is, team is able to benefit from it um, and everyone is able to use it and get that knowledge that they need from it. Well, I appreciate everything you said, but I'm, I want to dig into this a little bit more which is what about you personally? What motivates you? I mean, you know, I love that we cannot separate you from fireflies, but I'm curious about you. Yeah, for me, it's really about seeing how far can we scale this in a more systematic way. And, uh, you know, I, I've learned a lot through this journey of building the team from zero to almost 100 employees now. Um, and I've gotten to grow as an individual, as a manager, um, and as someone leading a team across different functions, right? It's not just product, it's including engineering, marketing, support, a customer success, sales, so all these different facets. So I'm constantly learning. So I'm using Fireflies as an opportunity to learn as much as possible, see how far it can scale, see how many people we can serve. And for me, like that is really like success where if we can do that, like turnkey day in, day out. Right. Um, and we started with a small little bot that to now this end to end platform. And we want to just see how far we can take it and how, how large we can scale it. Um, and we want to build this company in a very efficient manner. And that efficiency is something I, I deeply care about, uh, you know, thinking about systems engineering, things that I've studied in the past uh, related to operations, like. It's about like how we build the product and the type of culture we want to build. Uh, we really think of ourselves as a product-led company uh, rather than a sales and marketing-led company. And so that means we have to put 
the product and the customer at the heart of everything we do. And we don't want to lose that uh, culture and DNA. So for me, success is like, how do we scale this company to be something ubiquitous, like some of the products you use today, like everyone uses Calendly and knows about it, right? And sure. uh, you don't even have to talk about it. You just see the link in it. It works. In the same way, you see Fireflies attend your meeting or sends you the summary or notes afterwards. You know what it is. It's like a daily part of your life. So uh, how do we branch out and build that? That to me is success. And how do we do that without having to like always be working, you know, 100 hours, like 120 hours a week? So that's something on my, my personal goals is like trying to find more balance. But you know, things like this take sacrifice and effort. So I'm I'm putting in as much as I can. <laughs> amazing, amazing. And you know, I I noticed that you won all these awards, and you know, you're you're a highly decorated, and and you're on the younger side, right? You're you're still at the beginning of your career, right? You're 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 crushing it in every way, and here you are talking about balance. Let's talk about that for a second, because look, not everything is is so easy. You talked about this analogy of being in the desert, right, uh, and wandering around without a map, right? Like let's 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 talk about it where it hasn't gone so well for you, number one. And number two, let's think about, um, you know, how you find that balance and what does that really mean? Yeah, I feel like one year at a startup uh, is equivalent to like five. And then one year at a startup where you're doing everything from scratch on your own is more like seven to 10 years, right? So you are gaining a lot of knowledge and, uh, you know, things that I would not have learned if I was in corporate where I was within middle management and I'm, you know, pushing buttons or, you know, filing papers. I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but there is something to be said about, you know, when the puck falls at you at the end of the day, there's a different level of responsibility. So working on weekends, having your alerts and Slack notifications on all the time. Uh, I talk to other founders, like we have groups where we talk about like that constant demand and pull to be always on, right? You can never switch off as a founder or an entrepreneur or an early employee at a startup, like you're always on. But sometimes you can't see anything else other than that, right? That's the drive. That's the energy that get. that's what gets you up, right? There's something exciting to wake up to in the morning versus something mundane. Uh, so yeah, we've had our share of like, you know, challenges with uh, having to hire a really great person, but you know, for whatever reason, missing out right on that, like, you know, the market's very uh, intense. There was a lot of competition uh, for hiring. So that's definitely always a challenge. You want to get, keep and retain the best employees and hire the best folks. Uh, you know, there's things around like, you know, when you have an outage or uptime and like maintaining uptime is something you really care about. Like there are things we're doing migrations on like Friday nights, on Saturday nights, making sure things get like cleaned up. Uh, one of the analogies I have is like with fireflies, like we're scaling so much, like sometimes we have to fix the plumbing, right. Or change the plumbing, but you can't turn the water off. Right. Cause the system has to keep running even on weekends, uh, even on Friday nights. So there's this incredible challenge, right? So I think there's always things about how you build a product, how you scale it, how you think about your engineering decisions. So those are definitely like challenges, like a lot of, you make those mistakes, you build on the technical debt, you learn and you improve um, and you build processes around that. So I think, yeah, so there isn't one particular challenge, uh, but you do tend to build a lot of battle scars over the years. And the best thing you can do is learn to not repeat the same mistakes over again. Okay, if this issue happened or this bug happened, how do we ensure it doesn't happen again? If like this customer uh, wasn't able to get this value out of a feature, how do we make sure it doesn't happen again? So I don't want to make the mistake, same mistake twice. It's okay to make it once and learn from it. Um, but yeah, I, 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 that's, what, that's, that's my, my biggest take on this whole journey so far. That's fantastic. Um, all right. So let's let's shift gears once more and talk about the future of work. Uh, and and what what does that look like? Um, yeah. Wh what do you think? The future of work is already here. Uh, we've seen that. I think the pandemic accelerated it. Uh, we're going to have some form of hybrid or a lot of remote. Uh, so how you build your teams around globally distributed remote uh, hybrid workplaces is going to be very important. I know some of the larger companies want people back in the office, but people are, are going to push back. So maybe there's going to be a middle ground where they go into the office three times a week and then the rest of the time they're going remote. There's going to be employees where they're fully remote. Uh, I say remote because you can't think about the future of work without thinking about the 
nature around remote work. And uh, that is, I feel, here to stay. And the pandemic has proved that. Like we've had companies that IPO'd fully remotely, right? Where they've talked to their bankers, their investors, their teams, and uh, IPO'd. We've seen companies raise tons of money, do acquisitions, uh, do big, big things in a remote capacity. So I think remote is here to stay. Um, I definitely think there is a value to seeing people in person, having that in-person interaction. But uh, I do think the world of, or the future of work is where there's going to be remote. Uh, the other trends that I've seen with the re future of remote work is how do we automate repetitive mundane work? So if you look at like other industries or other technology sectors like RPA, robotic process automation, or uh, you know the integrations and workflows that people use like tools like Zapier to automate repetitive tasks, so I am a big believer in that. I'm a huge fan of uh, those technologies and tools. And I think what we are building at Fireflies at, at heart is a workflow software like that. Uh, it can be many things for many people. It can be a collaboration uh, knowledge base of all your meetings. It could be a workflow software that automates like meetings and takes notes. But I think we're going to see a lot more of that so that people can actually spend more time doing the high value creative work that knowledge workers need to do. And so we are going to see those advancements. Um, voice will play a small part in that bigger picture of like remote work, uh, automation, all of those things. The other thing that I think about when it comes to uh, this nature of future work is how we use AI to solve specific problems. Uh, generalized AI, I don't think is quite there. And even if you look at like Amazon Alexa or Siri uh, or any of the other tools that you use like Google Home, you're using it for very specific, simple tasks, like turn on the music, tell me some information. Whereas in the enterprise, uh, we can have more verticalized, more tailored uh, AI that can solve specific use cases. And I think we're going to start seeing more of the practical application of AI rather than hearing about it uh, in like, you know, the videos, but actually seeing it in action. And I don't think AI is just limited to like BI, like business intelligence, but it's actually like how can AI, GPT-3, uh, image recognition be used uh, to help complete tasks, uh, deliver insights and get work done. Um, so I, I look at those as like the major trends that I follow. Uh, Fireflies plays into that market to a certain extent as well. Uh, but yeah. So you're talking a lot about the pros of advancing technology, but what about the person who's listening who's going, yeah, man, but you're taking away jobs or you're, you know, what about the cons? Like, how do you, how do you kind of wrestle through the pros and cons of, of this AI technology and where it's going in the world of business? Yeah. And I can only speak to other knowledge workers, people in tech. Um, so it's, it's harder for me to talk about maybe the public sector or like construction or transportation or self-driving cars. Sure. Uh, but at least in the sector of tech and like what we're trying to do, uh, I believe that a lot of the technology that is being built today um, and new technology, new use cases is going to start opening up new jobs. Like how do you maintain the technology? How do you correct those things? Uh, how do you make sure that they're doing you know, the right thing? Um, how do you manage and service the, the AI and the tools that are there? So I think it's an ever evolving uh, space, uh, especially when it comes to this. I think with knowledge workers, a lot of times you're paid to think and you're paid to like deliver insights and value, right? Whether that's writing up uh, papers, reports, insights, uh, making business decisions. So a lot of that stuff, I feel like AI is here to facilitate rather than replace you. I don't think an AI can sit there and take a sales call for a salesperson, right? It can empower the salesperson by giving them all this material and insights. Like Fireflies can tell them, hey, you're asking about pricing way too much or you're bringing up competitors too early. Um, you need to make sure you talk for at least 40% of the time and not like 70% of the time on the call. So I think it's going to help assist at least what Fireflies is going to do. Um, and let's be honest, I don't think there's many salespeople or other folks out there that want to like sit and fill out their CRM or their recruiting system or send, you know, meeting notes afterwards. So there's like some of the mundane things that we're trying to solve. Uh, so that people can spend more time on having conversations and focusing. So uh, I think new technology creates the room for more opportunities and more technologies. There are definitely things that are like, you know, spreading, filling out spreadsheets, doing repetitive things. 
uh, that were bound to change or go, even whether or not this automation were to come in place, right? So it's, I think, a matter of um, how we also start trying to train and teach uh, uh, our, you know, labor force to like grow over time. Because think about like all the jobs before the industry sector arrived uh, versus afterwards. So we've had to learn uh, to live in a world where the internet exists, where like the cloud exists, uh, where smartphones exist. Uh, and, you know, you look at small businesses today, right? Like they had to do their own delivery versus now they're using these uh, payment systems, payment processors, uh, and it is enabling bigger markets for a lot of some of these companies as well. So I think the short answer to that is uh, uh, innovation will help create more opportunities, but at the same time, we can't neglect the learning and education that we need to provide people to up-level their skill sets. I love your your answer, man. I you just have such a great level headed view of all this. Look, with any technology, uh, historically, right? You know, things are changing and evolving, and you know, you you move uh, some jobs forward and some go away, some change, right? It's it's a constant evolution. I don't think this is any different, and and I love love the way you're thinking about this. Thank you for that, but. Uh, what is, as a startup founder, uh, what is the most important lesson that you've learned and, and taken away? Again, giving pragmatic advice to someone who's listening to this to, that they could actually take away and, and learn from either mistakes you've made or or things you've learned. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces of advice that I've learned um, from different people, from myself. Like, uh, so... It's hard to pinpoint on one, but I think the most important thing that I've learned is you have to know when you need to keep pushing uh, versus when you need to switch uh, and like say, hey, this is not working. I have to go do something else. And the reason I say that is a lot of people get very, very close where they build something good, uh, but then they're not seeing quite the traction that they're looking for. They're not seeing the business model work out the quite way, the, the quite the way that they want, pricing to work out quite the way. So sometimes you're 80%, 85% of the, the way there, and you're gonna see zero results. But if you're able to get 90% of the way there, you're gonna see 100% of the result. Uh, it, it is that thing where like that last five to 10% can make or break uh, a company or a founder, an entrepreneur, like the entire decision. So uh, there were many products and iterations that we built in the past where I felt like we pivoted too soon or we quit on it too soon where we go on to see like other people go in there, get very like pragmatic and, you know, buckle down and build something out of it. So I, I really do believe that um, if you're working on something and you know, there's a market, well, even if there's competition, uh, that means there is demand. And uh, it's just the difference between asking yourself, are we 80% of the way there? Would things change if we just went a little further, polished it a little bit more uh, and, tried to reach our like full potential. Like, have we reached our full potential on this before I kick the can and then go on to something else? So that's like the most pragmatic uh, advice I can, I can share that I've learned uh, where it's sometimes that last five to 10% that makes all the difference. You know, look, it's been a tough time out there, you know, and some people are, are have been struggling throughout, you know, this crazy pandemic time that we're all living in and all of that stuff. When you, you know, if, if someone was on this call, who's, who's been kicked down and is trying to get up off the mat, you know, and uh, is there any advice you'd give to them right now? Yeah, it is a tough time. Uh, you know, we've seen people lose jobs. Like uh, there's been just a lot of things that have happened. Uh, we've tried, we were dealing with like crazy inflation right now. Uh, there's so many things that, that are going on and we have to put those in perspective. I think as like a tech industry, we have to also be grateful for some of the benefits of the pandemic that we've been able to gain. Like you look at the tech stock, you look at like tech employment, like fundraising. Uh, sometimes we can become disillusioned with like, because all the like the tech folks were getting all of these, but we have to look at what the rest of the world was getting, right? So, um, you know, not everyone got like the full benefits of, of the pandemic. Um, in fact, it was the other way around where many, many people were struggling and then maybe 5% of those folks benefited from it. So we have to be very aware of that. I really, really think that, you know, my focus or way of approaching life is you have to control the things that you can control every day. Um, and 
you can't worry about the things that you can't control. Uh, and uh, at least, you know, you're hoping for the best, expecting the worst. But if you're able to approach each day where this is something I'm trying to solve, this is the one thing that I can control. I know I can deliver day in, day out. I can do this. I can show up. Um, I do believe 90% of life is showing up, like applying for that extra job, um, taking that extra interview. You never know, um, you know, what opportunity might pop up around the corner. Uh, there are just remember, there are far more people out there that are less talented than you, less skilled than you, uh, but became successful because they just showed, uh, you know, they showed up. And so don't sell yourself short, have that belief. And uh, if you can just learn one new thing every day and like get better at your craft, right? And if you can obsess over your craft and enjoy your craft, uh, you know, I, I do really believe things will turn around and you will find your own luck. Uh, but you know, that, that, that's probably like, that's what I believe. And sometimes it may or may not pan out. Sometimes it might take longer, but at the end of the day, I have to have that belief to keep going. Oh man, you, you nailed that one too. Uh, these, these must be softballs for you. So let's try something tougher. Um, it, just kidding. Um, you know, like what, what do you think is one question that I should have asked you today that I haven't asked you and how would you answer it? Uh, maybe things like who is entrepreneurship for versus who shouldn't get into entrepreneurship. Uh, cause I do get a lot of uh, questions from college students, high school students, like people that have been in like tech for a long time that says like, I really want to do this. Like, should I get into it? And, uh, I'm not going to lie. There are many times where I'm like, maybe I shouldn't have left Microsoft. Maybe I should have just had a simple, like straightforward nine to five, you know, nine to six, uh, where I can wake up, do my thing. Like I have certainty, right? I know what's coming each day and I have work-life balance. I can do things outside of work. I don't have to sacrifice friendships, relationships, like all of those things. So, uh, you know, I think that's a worthy question every person should ask themselves. But sometimes if you think too much about it, you're not going to be able to dive head first in. So you have to really experience it, right? You have to jump into the cauldron of fire to uh, know what it's like. Uh, but I, I think that would have been an interesting question to answer. And I would have shared, like, I, I tell a lot of people, yeah, don't do this, like, for these reasons. Uh, but if you're still crazy enough, go ahead. I'm not going to stop you, right? So there's, there's, you have to be, you know, some level of craziness in you to want to do this. Totally. And, and, you know, I guess you should add probably that the, um, the grass isn't always greener, right? You may think it is, but you may not. And, but then on the other hand, you don't know unless you try. So, uh, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. Um, but, uh, Anyways, look, Krish, I, I I absolutely love talking with you today. Uh, again, a huge fan of the work you guys are doing at Fireflies, and and uh, where can listeners find you uh, and your business online? Yeah, so Fireflies.ai. So it's in the name. It's the website as well. People can go sign up, start using it. We have a free tier. Uh, you can experience Fireflies yourself. Get it in your meetings. Have it take notes for you. Save time for you. Uh, and then we're rolling out a whole host of new features for teams. Uh, like around analytics, like channels, like all sorts of great stuff. Uh, in terms of finding us, you can find us on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn as well. So Krish Ramanini, uh, I've started, uh, you know, setting up my own Instagram, like public profile as well, so that I can talk more about entrepreneurship. So I'm as well there. Uh, it's at Krish Ramanini on IG. So I would say those are my two go-to channels uh, to reach out to me directly. Um, yeah. And then Fireflies, the website, as well as our uh, social pages. Perfect. So we can find you just about anywhere. We just look for Krish. Fireflies, we're going to find you. Uh, <laughs> but I, I got to say, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Really, uh, this is this is truly the definition of what we like to talk about with Triple G and success at scale. Uh, so thank you very, very much. What a pleasure. Uh, for those who are listening, please be sure to like, sh share, and subscribe. Uh, we definitely want to hear from you, connect with you, and uh, thanks for listening. Um, go get them out there, whatever you're up to these days. And uh, there it is. Until we talk next, have an awesome one and peace. Peace.